Today we welcome Oliver Thomas from BR Kingo's Architects to join us. Oliver is currently a BIM technology manager at BIC. Before that, he's worked at Front Inc. in New York City. And before that, it seems like you spent quite a bit of time in Hong Kong. Again with Front. Was it with Front or with AEDAS? And you're originally yeah. British, so oh, you yes. did your education from, yeah. in Britain, and then, well, you tell us what happened then. Yeah, well, uh, thanks very much for having me. Uh, excited to continue our conversations, really. Um, so yeah, I'll jump into a little bit of my, my background. As you say, I studied in the UK. I went through like your classic uh, UK uh, architecture degree, part one, part two, and eventually part three. Um, but yes, yeah, right after I graduated, I spent a little bit of time in London and then I moved to Hong Kong. I worked there for a number of years as like a design architect at IDAS, you know, typical stuff, design competitions or stage two, stage three kind of stuff. And uh, then whilst I was in Hong Kong, I joined Front and I kind of, uh, the reason why I joined Front was like I was, I was becoming like the grasshopper guy in the team. <laughs> and as a grasshopper guy, you always like designing the facade. You, you always spend a lot of time on the facade. And I got to a point where I was like, it'd be really cool to know how to actually build these things, build the facade, uh, and also use computational tools to do that. And it was at Smart Geometry. I met the guys at the front and they were like doing exactly that. They were building facades with computation for like, you know, a host of stack techs and cool projects. So I was like, uh, it'd be really cool to go there. So I spent a few years at Front, uh, worked on the Zaha Morpheus Hotel, World Trade Center with Rex, Seattle Space Needle, uh, and a bunch of other projects in between uh, where I really got to sink into the world of BIM and computation, like mostly Rhino and Grasshopper, also a bit of Revit, to actually fabricate things. And um, that was my little sidestep into deep BIM and computation to fabricate things. And then I wanted to go back into architecture and came back to the architecture world by joining BIG, where I'm now, uh, I started as a BIM specialist and now I'm a design technology manager. So I kind of cover everything under the umbrella of design technology, which is BIM computation, AR, VR, you know, AI is in the mix now, as well as like, collaborating as much as we can with with other disciplines like uh the vi visualization side of things workshop you know what elements interact with them like augmented reality or or you know real-time rendering and things like that so that's the that's my little elevator pitch great TV. so it you were the grasshopper guy it's funny that you say that because i felt like i was that person at the point until i had a colleague who was much better than me yeah and then i realized i know nothing and I learned whole loads about him from him. Now he's completely left architecture behind yeah. and doing more programming and development. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's exactly how I learned. I was uh, just learning from a couple of people in the office that were really good and, you know, start to pick it up. It was strange. I, I always thought I had a mind to think computationally. Uh, I, now I understand what that means a little bit more, but I was very kind of, I liked the design side, but I also like the logic behind a design. And I thought, wow, if I know if I could just script it, uh, it would be, you know, A, way more efficient and B, way more interesting. And so, yeah, that's why I started to gravitate towards it. And um, I struggled at uni because there wasn't anyone. I went to Liverpool in my master's and there wasn't anyone really there that, that knew it. So I was like, just kind of experimenting and in those early days of grasshopper not like in my early days of grasshopper when you're learning you can just get stuck for weeks on like the simplest thing but someone would be like well you shouldn't be flattening that list there yeah. <laughs> and so uh once i got in practice I'm, i was then like exposed to pe people that really knew this stuff and could quickly ask them and that's that's where my grasshopper really started to go and um, yeah. So yeah, I started as a, I was also using a bit of BIM as well. So it's kind of, uh, always had that mix of not just pure computation or pure BIM. I always had that mix of like 
you know, a bunch of different design technology aspects. Right. Okay. So you mentioned you worked at Front on some Zaha projects. Is there any particular project that maybe you can talk a little bit more about? Yeah, so I mean, the, the main one I, I worked on was uh, the Morpheus Hotel in Macau. It is a uh, hotel, which is kind of like a, it's secretly like a twin tower hotel, and then it's conjoined by these bridges. And then it's just wrapped in this exoskeleton. And so the middle of the building is super freeform. It's almost like, you know, in classic Maya style, these holes are punched through and you've got like these amazing kind of uh, geometry that, that covers the bridges. And so Front was hired by the contractor that was in the process of like about to build this thing. And one of the most complicated parts of the building is the uh, cladding for the exoskeleton structure. So uh, you have the facade. The facade was all faceted. It's built out of loads of little triangles, right? So none of the glass is actually mm. curved or anything like that. So it is complicated. Uh, but the, the most complicated part was just cladding this exoskeleton structure because it was, you know, every panel, we were, we were focused on the, all the freeform geometry. So every panel was unique. Uh, most panels are double curved, if not single curved. Uh, there's no one condition that's really the same. Uh, so we had to design a system, a detail that would, you know, basically hold Zaha's surface and turn it into panels and uh, Bureau Happel structure. And we had to work out everything in between. And so the only way that we could do that was with computation and BIM. And so uh, we developed a detail. We then came up with scripts that populates this detail on all these different conditions. And then once we have this epic BIM model, we then extract all the information out in the form of uh, fabrication drawings, uh, tabulated data, which just means Excel, you know, an epic Excel of dimensions of things, um, and various, like, whatever they needed to kind of actually fabricate and stuff. And so we were just purely in Rhino and Grasshopper uh, using Front's uh, plugin called Elefront, which basically gives you the fundamentals of BIM in Rhino using Grasshopper, which was like, you can store information in the geometry, sort information via that geometry uh, data. And so you can really quickly turn your Rhino model into a, a quite a powerful BIM uh, model. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was the beast that I was working on in, uh, in for, for Zaha. Right. Yeah. So I had a look before this call. Uh, at the, I mean, everybody probably knows it, but I looked at some details and the detailing on the facade is impeccable, you know, so really good job being on that team to develop that, which you don't get a lot of, you know, when you work on big projects, especially in China, the detailing tends to be a bit left behind. But I suppose in this building, it was so difficult that either you get it and you make it right, or it just doesn't work at all. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 really an example of the true promise of BIM uh, in that, like, if you do, the idea is if we can absorb all the complexity in the digital side, in Rhino, in this virtual environment, then in theory, if we model everything literally to nuts and bolts, in theory, the construction process will be a lot smoother. And I think for years, the construction industry has relied that, oh, they'll sort that out on site. And, and because we don't, we only model it or draw it to a certain level. Um, and I think on that project, it's a, you know, crazy timeline, crazy geometry. Everything about it is, is kind of crazy. Um, yet there was like very few change orders or issues once they started to build it because we had kind of looked at every condition. And the only way we could do that was through the use of computation and, and BIM. Really. And what kind of data did you inherit? Because it sounds like the design was pretty much completed when you got on board with the contractor. So you had yeah. some, was it a Revit model or a Maya model or Rhino? And how usable was that data for what you were doing? So we had a surface from Zaha uh, that was from Rhino. 
uh, and they had indicated where they want to where they wanted their panel lines to be and they basically gave us like a rule set right we want panel lines to either be here of course we had to go back and actually create the panelization based on the fabrication limits for example uh I can't remember if this is the exact dimension off the top of my head, but we could only source a sheet aluminium in uh, two by five meters or, or something like that. So that dictates how big your panel can be. And so it means that, a, a, you know, a, 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 a beam like that's this long, they may have wanted to divide twice, but we actually had to divide mm. three times because of the fabrication limit. So Zaha gave us a, rhino surface and rules and indication of like where they want to see joints and then bureau happold gave us a structural model and i remember i think we did have to convert it into rhino geometry and and clean it for our purposes uh, i can't remember the native format they gave us maybe ifc um so yeah we we basically had a a model from bureau happold of the structure and a surface from zaha and some rules and that was it. We had to work out mm. everything in between <laughs> this cavity. It sounds really exciting, but also really daunting that what you're working on, you know, if you get it wrong, yeah. there's a panel with a chance of coming out and hitting somebody. <laughs> yeah. And in, in Macau, don't forget, you've got um, mm. typhoons. So like uh, very high wind loads. Um, so yeah, it wasn't like we were building in, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's they have extreme temperatures and and also like uh, storms and things like that so yeah and and that's the real side of it is we're working for the contractors and building stuff so uh you know that's how you can really test yourself and test technology right okay so then so at some point you moved i don't know if it's with this project or a different project to new york right and you decided to join yeah br kingles architects working on the beam side of things but now with the contractor or construction based experience i suppose that somehow also made you a very useful bim manager right because you could consult people in the office and how to do that better so there is less errors and less processing going on post design yeah yeah so that was actually my first project at Front, and Front are a U.S. firm. So once I finished the Zaha project in Hong Kong, I then moved to New York. I worked for uh, Front in New York for a little bit on uh, the uh, Performing Arts Center, which is part of the World Trade Center. That was with Rex Architects, and worked on a few other projects. And then, yeah, joined Big in New York. I had to uh, come back to UK, get a new visa and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I was, I was itching to get back to architecture. Um, it's really interesting working with all these different architects as a facade consultant. And you, the really interesting thing is you get to peek into how each one works. And even though you're not there in the office, you know, workflow, you receive their models or you're having, you know, sometimes you work with them on competitions, you get a little insight into how each one works and the software they use and all this kind of stuff. But, uh, I was always really interested in Big's work. I've always really liked Big's work and it's work that connects with my own like uh, outlook on design and uh, what, you know, what I think architects could achieve. Um, so yeah, I was very fortunate in that like the stars aligned and they were looking for uh, someone on the tech side. So I initially joined the BIM team um, in New York. I was a BIM specialist uh, working under a guy called Jan, who is uh, kind of like the guy who set up uh, BIM in the New York side, which has now kind of actually gone on to set the tone for all the other offices are big. Um, so I joined as a BIM specialist, but they knew I had this computational background um, and this kind of unique fabrication side. So on one hand, that's super interesting. On the other hand, I've kind of gone to the complete other end of the spectrum, right? I was working for contractors, but also architects, right? Uh, in the nuts, literally mm. nuts and bolts to a design firm where we're like, you know, doing concept proposals and in, you know, six to eight weeks and, you know, other concept proposals are a little bit longer, schematic design DD. So some of that experience is really good, but it wasn't immediately 
applicable, like, you know, fabrication information level stuff. But a lot of the processes and the technology translates into the architecture side. And of course, I am an architect. I've been in that design environment for many years. So it was kind of an easy transition to come back. And I was also trying to understand, like, do I want to go back as a designer and be like a, a, a super teched up designer, which, which is great because you can implement it delivering a project. Um, and so I actually interviewed both. I was like, I interviewed as a designer and also as a specialist. And uh, I thought at the end, the BIM side seemed kind of, there was a lot of room to grow. They were also looking for someone with a bit of something else, like not just BIM, but computation as well. And uh, I really liked the vibe of, of uh, Jan and the office. So I decided uh, I joined the BIM team as a specialist. Uh, and that's where I started to kind of piece together other things. So we were implementing BIM, but also using computation to like bring things back and forth between the Rhino, the Rhino world and the Revit world. And it was also around that time that Rhino Inside came out. So then uh, we jumped onto Rhino Inside and we were kind of early adopters. And it's something that I now uh, use a lot and teach a lot outside. So you're kind of the blender guy. I was like the Rhino Inside guy for the last few years. Uh, so um, yeah, and, and then it's just kind of expanded from there. I um, you know, also started to be interested in augmented reality and virtual reality and started to drive that within the office. Uh, so then I was working in BIM, computation, AR and VR. And, you know, we also kind of evolved the technology team to not just be these separate disciplines of the BIM crew, the computational crew. And we now had profiles like myself that kind of bled between these different areas. And so now we are kind of like a design technology mm -hmm. team with these kind of sub branches of BIM and computation and AR and VR and that kind of stuff. And which you see in a lot of offices, particularly how now the tools are becoming so interlinked and overlapping, right? Game engines are now coming into the world of BIM and, you know, Rhino and Grasshopper is literally inside Revit now. And so all these tools are kind of colliding together. Right. And so what is your current role? What does that encompass in your day-to-day -day activities? Yeah. So my day-to-day -day activities, it's, it's always hard to know what my day is going to be like. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember how that felt. You, know, you go Monday and you're sure, you're not sure whether, you know, there's a new competition or, you know, you have to just yeah, exactly. sort something out on the computer in some files. So yeah, my weeks, sometimes like this week is going to be super cool. I'll finally get to do my Blender course <laughs> and then you come in and it's the <laughs> craziest week ever. But uh, essentially I have, uh, I, I describe myself as like an in-house technology consultant for everyone in the office, right? So I manage the design technology side of the London office. There's a design technology manager of each office. Essentially, we currently have uh, five offices, um, although Shenzhen right now is quite small, but there's London, Copenhagen, New York, and Barcelona. Mm, I didn't know there's an office in and, Barcelona as um, well. Yeah, yeah, it's, and it's also growing. So London and Barcelona are kind of uh, the, the newer kids on the block, and we're kind of in that growth phase. Uh, so London has really grown. So I oversee the deployment of BIM, like all the projects that we have in BIM. It can be real real BIM stuff, like BIM execution plans, setting up how we collaborate with consultants and all this kind of stuff. I also oversee the computational side. Um, so, you know, a project could come and they want to uh, uh, help with a script to uh, design a facade or something like that. And I'll either help them develop them themselves or I'll write a script for them so they can use it. And then there's the kind of other av areas of augmented reality and virtual reality. So I oversee that we've set up, you know, VR rooms and experimenting with HoloLenses. So, uh, and then more recently we've got AI where we're kind of launching big, uh, I, I started to push big AI in the office where we're just getting up to grips with all these new tools. So on one hand, I'm like on a day-to-day -day basis, like consulting projects and 
uh, you know, very much project based and helping the guys out either, you know, with advanced workflows and things like that. And then on the other hand, I have like looking at the office as a whole and trying to elevate Bigster's design technology skill sets. So I host a lot of training, Grasshopper, Revit, Rhino Inside, you know, all those kind of things, but also testing new technologies that we think will uniquely enhance the design process of big. And so AI is a good example of that, like all these things going on, let's test them. Let's see if they actually work in our design process. And uh, if they do, then we'll adopt them. And uh, it's kind of like our design process. It's survival of the fittest design mm. technology. Like sometimes I introduce a technology and people are really excited about it, but they just, it doesn't get adopted because it's kind of, you know, extra work to make it happen or, or like, you know, a client's not that interested in it. Other ones I kind of introduce and before I know it, like every product's using it. So it's quite interesting. It's an interesting environment to see what is working right now. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of on one foot, a consultant helping out all the projects and working with the, the project teams. And then on the other hand, overviewing the whole office and, and uh, the direction that we want to go in in design technology. It sounds like a pretty big role, a pretty important one on both hands, you know, for production side of things and also for the future side of things. So congratulations in being yeah. there. And how big is your team to manage and how big is the London team? Because I know it has been just growing and growing and growing steadily over the last few years since it opened up. The London office now is, I think, 120 wow. plus people, maybe. Maybe don't quote me on that, but yeah, I think we're around that number. Um, my the DT team here is three people right now. So there's myself. Uh, we have a, you know, more of a BIM specific specialist and a computational specialist. And actually, we're probably expanding. We're in the process of expanding at the moment. Um, and then globally, you know, different offices have different people. So Copenhagen has a has a few more people on the BIM and computational side. Obviously, that's the headquarter office. Uh, globally, I don't know what our DT number is, um, but we rough, you know, we're, we're we're a smaller DT team compared to other firms our size. Um, but that's also because we we try and elevate the designers as much as we can. So, for example, on the BIM side, we are not here building the models for them, and you know, they just get a shiny Revit model. At, at, at Friday when they need to submit. All the designers who have been in the concept stage are also the designers that are in Revit detailing and all this kind of stuff. So um, yeah, we're, we're a light crew, but we've all, we've all got like specialist little skills and we very much stay connected globally. So uh, we think globally and act locally. That's great. Yeah, and it, it, knowing big projects that all look a bit more intense on the design tech side of things than your typical project out there. I would imagine that either you have had a bigger design technology team or perhaps like you're saying, maybe a lot of the staff actually knows some of those tools or it sounds also like you, you guys provide training for them within the office. So what is the competency yeah. of you know Rhino, Grasshopper, Revit, Advanced Revit, you know, adaptive components, dynamo, these kinds of things. Are there a lot of people that know just a bit or some that are quite advanced? And then is there some sort of like a internal user group where people can share best practices or experiences from this project and how that can impact the whole office? Yeah, so... Uh... Of course, you know, we're lucky that we get to work with like the designers are all super talented. Like I get to work with very, very smart, talented people here. So teaching them is is not usually too hard because they they pick up things quickly. Uh, that being said, you know, there's still a um, I think big has been like a grassroots uh, computational firm. Like a lot of designers have a OK level of grasshopper. Of course, we do have like standout computational leads. They're kind of like, and they typically be project leaders. Like it's, um, 
it's no coincidence that some of our go-to project leaders are, you know, usually really good at computation at the same time, right? So um, I, I really recommend designers getting into computation to not only streamline their production side, but also I, I really think it enhances your design time because you can explore more things, automate things so that you can spend more time designing. So we do have some really good like uh, computational designers that are computational. But uh, the general level, I would say, is kind of, you know, beginner to intermediate. So especially when people join the office, uh, we everyone has a pretty good level of Rhino. I would say that's a base. So Rhino-wise, everyone is like intermediate to advanced. Grasshopper is, generally speaking, more beginner to intermediate. And then we have some standout advanced people. Um, and that's why I'm always pushing when we get new batches of people join the office, we try and do boot camps where we can give them Rhino tips, grasshopper tips and things like that. And then you've got Revit and the BIM side is more the office evolves over time. Cause like as any office you start off and you grow, you're going to be more concept heavy, let's say. And then as you get into stage two, stage three, I'm referring to the UK design stages then you need to get into the Revit world and every every office has their first big Revit project, which is always like, a, it's always a, a mess and a, and a bit of a shit show, but then out of it comes this like amazing drawing set. And then you learn from that one and you start to set up your standards and your, your you know, how you want it to graphically look like. And then the team that worked on that start to evolve and they may move on to that another product. So then, you know, the team is the the office wide BIM skills are getting better and better. So uh, the BIM side is growing over time. I think we're, we're at a point where we've got a good uh, core of Revit users now. And we're, you know, here in London, we've done a few big projects. And of course, we're lucky because we're we're learning from our big brothers, the, the New York office and the Copenhagen office that have been doing this for years and, you know, really have. Uh, the BIM side of things uh, in a solid state, so we can cheat a little bit and follow from following their footsteps. But the general level is good, but there's always room to improve, and that's why I'm a big believer in training. And I'm always trying to train people in the office and also outside the office to up our design technology skill sets. Um, so yeah, there's always room for for training, even in a firm like Big. For sure. Which was the big project for the London office? Was it the building across from Goldman Sachs? Uh, from Goldman Sachs, we've well, of course, the evolution in this office was uh, this office started because of the Google project. Um, so the Google headquarters in London. Uh, then the next project we had a a, a tower in Berlin. Um, it's called the ETB Tower. Uh, and then we have got our Daily Express building, uh, which is our more recent. I think that's the one you're referring to. I actually don't know. It's if, around Fleet uh, Street. You know, it it can't yeah, be anything yeah, else. It. I'm sure. You know, if it's yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, our Fleet Street project. That's been our big UK project now, and now we've got like another two. So we're kind of uh, evolving, and we've had lots of like uh, BIM projects around that. So. We use Revit for any product that comes out of concept, regardless of if we are required to or uh, a client makes us. We use it as an in-house process anyway. So, um, yeah, all of our products will transition into Revit once they come out of concept and go into schematic or in the UK, that's stage three. And is um, concept always Rhino and Grasshopper? Is there room or do other people know use different kinds of programs? No, we're pretty, we're pretty solidly a Rhino, you know, grasshopper, um, firm, uh, absolutely no sketch up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, I'm trying to no, there's really no other programs apart from like a few things. Like I have ventured into blender here and there for, um, like I was talking to you before some, bringing typologies of landscapes and things in for whatever reason, I found a couple of videos that helped me out. So I ended up in blender, uh, but that's, 
that's yeah we're m mostly a rhino and uh, grasshopper farm. that's interesting i would have thought some of the aa grads would have brought some maya skills with them or from some of the other offices no so there's we have a single maya license <laughs> and that's from a guy who came from zaha that was like really trying to push it the thing with with and and this is a large part of what what I do is like looking at the office as a whole. The thing is, especially when you get bigger, right? If you have all all these, if you kind of let it be like a free for all, you could have one team over there using Blender, another team using Maya, another team using Rhino, someone using SketchUp. Um, and the way that it works, a big is like the teams are just formed around uh, the project. So. You don't work for uh, so-and-so partner or director, and that's it, right? New product comes in, let's grab you, 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 and it, it's very organic around the project. So people are jumping around all the time. So just from a workflow, if you have like one product is in, let's say, Maya, and another product is in Rhino, and another product is in Blender, I've got to train everyone up in three programs now. Uh, I can see the so sweat they can coming work out of your pores products, just right? thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> just, stretch, just thinking about it. And and of course, don't get me wrong. We we look at all of these, like, uh, and we have a bunch of AA people. I, honestly, the AA guys don't push Maya that hard. I, I don't think it's as heavy. Maybe if you're coming out of the DRL specifically, that's. Um, it, yeah. But otherwise, I don't like the AA guys aren't asking to use Maya. We have a couple that pushed it and pitched it and we do look at it the problem with specifically maya is i keep asking people to show me anything that doesn't look exactly like zaha because it's it's so intertwined with one thing which is freeform curvy geometry i know you can do other things in it but I've, i'm yet to see um good examples of it that you can't do in rhino um, and of course, there's people that bounce between offices, like there's people that have worked at Zaha, there's people from Fosters and all these different firms, right, that come, you know, that inevitably work at other firms. And you, you get some people that, you know, have come from the Maya world and they're like, you can do it all in Rhino with, with Sub-D. And you get the other more purists that are like, oh, you're missing the the exact curve of <laughs> of Maya and things like that. So we're always testing it, but we've we've got to balance that that world of um, everyone is trained and can bounce between products. And it's, it's also, you know, think about money wise, like um, again, not to, not to focus on Maya, but like Maya costs like 3000 pounds, I think. And it's not included in our licenses for Revit. So now you're, you're doubling, you're tripling your license cost. Whereas Rhino is a, uh, perpetual license it's i think right now less than a thousand dollars so if you switch to maya you're you're double you're tripling your license cost uh, and that's just for a year license so you're tripling it every you know every year you're paying more and more so uh these are the kind of things you need to balance especially on our side on the dt side but uh we do test all these things yeah, it's uh, and, and it's never replacing Rhino, right? It's always in addition yeah. to Rhino. But Rhino is great because, as you said, they're perpetual and their upgrades are even cheaper, which happen, you know, four or five years yeah. apart. Uh, and, you know, I think we're big fans of McNeil. I think they're, they're one of our, you know, they are the, our favorite uh, software company in that they come in and they visit us and they ask us what works and what doesn't and they they and they it's not just us they do that to many other firms they really care about they they are building this for the end user they're not building this uh for shareholders and all that kind of stuff they they are really uh developing it <clears throat> for people that use it and <clears throat> that's why rhino is such a great is a great piece of software mm -hmm. um so yeah you're never going to get rid of it there's also a great story of um, also the industry drives this as well. For example, the Copenhagen office in its early days was an Archicad firm uh, on the BIM side. They use Archicad at the beginning. And there was one point where Copenhagen was Archicad. And, and when New York got started, they jumped onto Revit. 
And the problem that Copenhagen was always having was they could never get rid of Revit because when they were working on a product that, you know, they were the d design architects or, uh, I don't know, a government product or something like that, they were sometimes made to work in Revit because that was the industry standard. So even when they went down the Archicad road, Revit was always this like kid they could not get rid of. So then you have to have two BIM standards and two BIM protocols. And so sometimes the industry dictates uh, your software as well a, a little bit. And does the Copenhagen office use Revit exclusively now or do they still use Archicad? Yeah. No, we're, we're so about the time I joined in 2018 uh, was about the time they completely switched to uh, Revit. So now we're globally a, a Revit firm. That's a shame. <laughs> I, I I said from a different perspective, clearly, you know, from your role, it, it would be ideal if just everybody worked in one piece of software that you no know, matter yeah. where you can pull and grab information. But from the other end of things, you know, Autodesk is getting is becoming a bigger and bigger monopoly, which hinders development. And as we all know from the open letters yeah. a few years back, what that consists of, you know, basically, you tell me you probably know a bit better than I would, but Revit hasn't really developed a lot of new tools, except minor adjustments and bug fixes in like the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and we're, we're big. Uh, I totally agree with that. Like Revit is over 20 years old at this point and they haven't kind of reinvented the, the stack for a long time. Um, the improvements that we see are kind of incremental at best. <laughs> like, uh, and, you know, we're in this era where we do use the, pro the programs that are best suitable for it, right? We don't, we don't design in Revit because it's not flexible at all in the design stages, but it is very good on the documentation side of, you know, automating the drawings a little bit, uh, creating drawing packages, collaborating. That's a big reason why I think Archicad's a little bit weaker on the collaboration side. That's one of the reasons why it's, it's maybe not as adopted globally. Um, but yeah, with, with all these other things of game engines, AI and, and uh, you know, cloud, working in the cloud, uh, we, see, you know, we're, we see on the horizon there's going to be some big disruption in the BIM side of things. Uh, and, you know, either Revit kind of really reinvents uh, the wheel or, you know, it will be replaced by, by something else with, that's probably, as we were kind of discussing, the, the piece of the puzzle are out there. You've got things like, Blender BIM is is a one piece of the puzzle. You've got companies like Hyper is a good example of something that's based in the cloud that can use the power of computation and all these different, you know, Unreal Game Engine. All of the pieces are out there to create what I think, you know, I'm hearing people calling it like BIM 3.0, where maybe it's one environment we design, document, visualize in one environment. But, uh, We'll see if it we'll see if it comes. <laughs> it sounds particularly exciting, and maybe not one environment, but one interchangeable format where it's very easy w without losing much data in the process. Mm. And that's yeah. the other question I wanted to ask you: is how seamless is the process from concept design to develop design? In other words, from coming in from Rhino and then driving the geometry into Revit within the office. Yeah, I think it's it's as seamless as we can make it uh, based on a couple of things, right? So as I said, we jumped on Rhino Inside pretty early. So now we have a very clear bridge between the two, which is Grasshopper. Uh, and the great thing about that is some of the designers know Grasshopper on the design side. So they're starting to peek into Revit through Grasshopper. And then some of the, like, the Revit people are kind of getting into Rhino through Grasshopper the other way. So we now have this bridge between the two. We also have other plugins like Beam is a good one uh, that, that can do these things. Um, but we have a pretty good workflow between the two. But sometimes it's, it's a direct transition. Sometimes it's deliberately 
a bit of a, okay, let's stop in the Rhino world and rebuild in the Revit world because the good thing about, you know, let's say a concept project, right? You have a six to eight week concept project. Of course, you're not going to solve everything in that time. Um, and so like, yeah, out of concept, you come out with, you know, some plans, so a, a 3D model, uh, and then you go into the Revit world. And if usually if it's a smaller scale and you've really cleanly modeled things and it's it's working, of course, we can translate that into Revit, the Revit world and kind of continue the, the workflow. But it's also sometimes a nice point where you kind of use those elements but also rethink them. And for example, drawing a stair in Rhino, you can get away with drawing, you know, uh, you're just drawing in 2D. And so you may be a tread short, right? Because you just, you're in that, in that phase. Sure, yeah. But then in, in, in Revit, you, you can't get away with like being a, a tread short. You've got to draw it because you're drawing it in 2D and 3D at the same time. So it's usually, it's kind of like a perfect combination of, uh, you know, once we move into this stage, this is this is exactly what the stage is for. It's where you work all these things out. So, uh, like a core, we may bring in the bare bones of it, but that's actually where you want to draw your stairs and perfect them at that stage. Um, but we could bring in the massing and the facade and the the shell. And so often it comes out of concept. We set up all the right Revit side, and we bring in as much as we can through Rhino inside. So now the team start with like a shell rather than it's just an empty, sp <laughs> an empty space of, uh, of Revit. So we're always trying to streamline as much as we can um, with scripts and automation, but sometimes you don't, you know, you, you want to actually look and delve into the details of things. Uh, and it's not just between Rhino and Revit. It's also how can we streamline the, the design process for example, visualization, like real-time rendering has disrupted the way that we work because now we can seamlessly go into Enscape, for example. We jumped on Enscape super early. Uh, we also experiment with twin motion as well. Like our workflows seamlessly go into this environment where we can pull out images, animation, panos, VR, all this like kind of for free once that we've set up our environment. So um, I'm always trying to see how much we can streamline the design process. And the goal is if we can streamline some of these things, the designers can spend more time designing and less time like, you know, drawing a wall line by line or, <laughs> you know, these kind of things. That's always the goal, isn't it? To get rid of yeah. all of that. And in that respect, unfortunately, back to one of your earlier points, Revit is still king. I admit it myself, I had a small private project where I thought it would be perfect to try to experiment with some additional tools. So there is a tool called FreeCAD, which is a little bit like Katia. So it's more geared towards um, industrial design, but there's also a BIM workbench within it. And in, on the 3D side of things, it's great documentation. You know, if you're coming from the Revit world, you're like, I can't believe you, you can't, you know, just have a a dimension that's fixed to that wall and yeah. I spent so much time and so many long nights just trying to like wrestle with the model and then there was some kind of issue with the project and I had to really quickly develop it much further so I rebuilt it in two days you know because it wasn't a very complicated yeah. project so yeah unfortunately the one thing that Revit does really well which is actually a very big part of architecture that we don't perhaps yeah. talk a lot about is walls, doors, areas, dimensions, right? Yeah. So these four things, it does better than anything out there at the moment. Yeah. And, you know, whilst I'm, I'm giving a uh, Revit a bit of a hard time, <laughs> it's still, you know, it's still how we deliver buildings today. Uh, and it's a huge step forwards from the 2D BIM era of AutoCAD, um, you know, and, and it's still being adopted. And this is how we deliver buildings today. Uh, we deliver all of the products that you see being built uh, from big have a BIM model behind it. And that the reason why they're built is because we have to, it's not the reason that they're built, but like a huge component in getting them built is because we have documented them using programs like Revit. Uh, and also the interesting thing right now, 
I mean, whilst Revit needs development, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. And the thing is, the demand for, you know, Revit savvy architects is super high. So it's really hard to find architects that are good at, can use Revit in a project. And so like one of the most valuable things you can do right now is have that Revit skill set. So whilst uh, we're looking into the future right now, it is one of the most in-demand skill sets uh, Interesting. You know, at the moment. So. And do you mean like just general, you know, making sure that when you move a wall, being aware of what that means in the whole model? Or do you mean more on the documentation side or maybe like adaptive compo adaptive families or Dynamo site or a little bit of all of that? No, it's not even getting into the, you know, Dynamo and Grasshopper and adaptive components, building your own families. I would say that's at the advanced ends and that's actually what we help the, the teams the most building. It's, we're just talking about like you are a competent architect, but you're also competent at Revit and you can draw and you can document and you understand how to set up a drawing set and print a drawing set and, you know, all these kind okay, of things. Okay, so basic document things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you're just a BIM savvy architect, right? And it sounds like, oh, surely everyone has that, but you'd be surprised that it's, it's, also, it's hard to find people that have both sides of the coin, right? You mm. have to be a good designer and a good architect, but also you have that BIM uh, skill set. And if you've got BIM and computation, you're you're very valuable. Interesting. Maybe I should think about re-entering the job market in big corporate firms. <laughs> I mean, yes, especially right now, you know, the, there seems to be a big demand for uh, for people like that. So it's also interesting for another aspect. You know, I would have told that to me, the most sophisticated markets in the world are London and New York in regards to architecture and design, right? So whatever new technologies are being developed on a wider scale, they probably come out from one of those two markets. So the talent pool within those two places surely should be a little bit more tech savvy than your average designer coming perhaps from somewhere else. Yeah, I think, uh, well, you, you say that, but, you know, the architecture world is a small community. Uh, for example, I bumped into some some Foster's people. They have over 100 BIM coordinators now in the, in the office. So, uh, you know, they I know they've hired wow. a ton of people. Um, so a lot of people are trying to, like, uh, when I say that the demand's there, it's, it's just the demand is out wearing the supply right now. Um, you know, there are a lot of firms in, in London or New York. Um, and I think it's also a component is, is like COVID. People, you know, relocated to different places. Some don't want to come back to the city and, and work full time in an office. Um, so, you know, I think the, whilst, yeah, we are in a major uh, talent pool, a lot of that talent is, is gone elsewhere. And, uh, some firms have adapted to working remotely and some firms have gone back to working full time. So mm. it's just uh, balancing that. I think it's as much like, a, you know, COVID mixed up uh, the, this world of, of uh, hiring people in, you know, some people change industries and, and all this kind of stuff. But, but yeah, right now I feel like there's a big demand for, uh, tech savvy architects interesting so for those tech savvy listeners it's a probably a good time to start applying to different job yeah. roles St keep your eye out for uh, some postings from london i think they'll be uh, we'll be looking to hire potentially soon great so i'm the blender guy right you're the rhino inside guy so yeah, good yeah. to know <laughs> if we could label one person with one sentence what would they be at least professionally uh, yeah. So I have to ask this, right? So if a, a designer comes into the office in, and they are quite competent in Blender, would you kind of allow them or rather restrict them to develop something in Blender that they could, you know, potentially then import into Rhino and then Revit and whatever? Like, yeah. is that discouraged or... Is there a place for people that can bring their own skill set somewhere else that are, you know, yeah. may, it's not in the masses, right? And they're not doing a whole building, let's say, 
but they're looking perhaps at a part of something. So is there a place for people like that? For sure, yeah. That's I I never want to be like the tech police in the office <laughs> and be like, oh my God, are you using... <laughs> Uninstall that now, <laughs> right? Because because that's also how we learn as well. Like, um, you know, we had a couple of people come in and, and a few years ago we looked at Enscape versus Twinmotion. We went down the Enscape road. But then some people came recently and they, they're really good at twin motion. So we were like, okay, let's, let's have a look at it. And they used it on a project that it really suited twin motion. And so um, now it means that we're looking at it more seriously. So, Well, that I'm problem always... is a bit solved with your next contract renewal at the office because twin motion is now part of the Autodesk pack. Yeah. Yeah. So on one hand, that, that's a good thing. Uh, but now people want a license for twin motion, so they get a license for Revit as well. <laughs> as well, so uh, <laughs> true. It's kind of <laughs> double like edged a, sword. That's the real world problem. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I I never want to be that guy that like shuts down. Oh no, we can't do this. At the same time, for the reason I explained earlier, we can't just let it be a free throw of anyone's using anything. So if people want to use it, I'm really open to like okay use it and use it on the project um, and show me, let's talk through it and see if it's something that actually works globally. Um, sometimes it may be like I've had people want to, you know, use a piece of software and the reason is really because they don't know Rhino that well. So they want to stay in their safe zone. So then actually the solution is to give them a bit more training in Rhino and like, oh, here's, uh, here's blocks in Rhino or sub D or, you know, whatever it is. Um, on other times, it's like, oh, actually, this is a completely different problem, uh, and maybe we should look into this. So um, I never want to be shutting down people just because they're using a different program. Equally, we gotta we got to make sure that we're aligned as a firm to keep our workflows as seamless as possible. So it's always striking that balance. But mm. um, but that's that's also the environment here, Big Way. It's a very open environment to come up with new ideas on the design side. So we also inherit that on the technology side. Uh, so, you know, we, we look at it, we evaluate it, and we're like, it's really cool. I don't see it working for everyone, but I'm happy for you to use it. And, and here's the workflows. Or sometimes we're like, actually, this is really good. Let's look at it. Let's reevaluate. And actually, we might we might adopt this thing. Hmm. You... you um... This topic actually brings in a, a potential idea for another po another call with you, which is maybe we should have a serious one-to-one -one of Rhino, Rhino versus Blender and what, <laughs> especially in the we differences. We could have a, a model off. We'll uh, we'll try and model the same <laughs> thing. I feel like I would lose that quite because Blender could be quite quick, but yeah, that could be fun. I see. Yeah, well, first it might be a call. Maybe then you know we can jump onto the actual design side yeah. of things. <laughs> We'll because yes, th that's where we'll it could it off offer a, yeah. a lot of potential is uh, yeah. in some of the think n there's nothing you can't do with Grasshopper, but sometimes it's just the amount of time that it does take yeah. to build up something with Grasshopper. Whereas with Blender, yeah. you could just click on a button, add a modifier, and here you go. You've got mirror, you've got non-destructive yeah. booleans, and this is not something that you have to script at all or create a node tree on. It's just inherently part of the way that the software works right and I, I always want to keep an open mind to that because like what you also don't want to do is be like well, i'm the grasshopper guy right so a uh, blender can do these kind of like grasshoppery things like with these modifiers and and the nodes and all this kind of stuff and so sometimes you get people that are like oh yeah but that's not pure computation and i want to stay in my grasshopper world because you have more control and you, you know, you have the detailed control, right? But at the same time, Blender may give you that quick access. So now many people can use it because they don't need that kind of deeper knowledge of Grasshopper. So mm. you, I just always want to try and create, create a open mindset and not get also, uh, I forget what the word of it, but like, uh, dug into my, what I'm comfortable in. Like I'm a grasshopper guy, so I don't want to look at uh, blueprints in Unreal because it's not it's not like pure computation. 
Wow. Because then, then you become like the AutoCAD guy in the office. They're like, I love this, I, you know, and they're still like <laughs> stuck in there. Yeah. Uh, and also, you know, for those guys that are saying that, if there is somebody saying that, you know, pure computation is not Rhino either. Pure computation is you pick up, you know, C Sharp or Python or yeah, C++ right, right. and you do so it over yeah. there. The, co the coders are looking down on the Grasshopper guys and then they were looking down on the the uh, modify crew. And, <laughs> and then you got AI turning up and just doing everyone. <laughs> totally still in the party. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So besides Big, you also have you, you you're quite involved with doing your own podcasts, right? And your own courses. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um I've definitely always been interested in teaching at some point and uh I thought of a few different, you know, because I've been teaching in-house at various different places for a little while and uh, I thought, you know, what's the best way that I can impact as many people as possible? And so, you know, I could go and work for a university and I can maybe have like, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 50 students, however many students you could fit in a room or online. But I thought, well, it, it takes the same amount of effort to come up with a syllabus and teach and, and do these things to do it for one uh, class of people or one university where only 20, 30 or 100 people can be exposed to it. Whereas I could teach online and potentially thousands of people could uh, could access it and people from all different parts of the world, which excites me the most. And so it was. I've always been thinking about this. And then, of course, during COVID, Clubhouse came out and uh, I thought this could be a really good way just to start things off and we started and founded uh, Architect Network by just having a weekly podcast on Clubhouse. And uh, we just ha were having conversations about architecture and technology. And then we've evolved to a podcast and then starting a YouTube channel where we try and do quick videos and courses. That's a little bit on hold right now because the third thing we're really concentrating on is courses and like uh, online courses. So we, we launched a Grasshopper Masterclass we are launching a Revit masterclass. Uh, by the time this is published, this is probably going to be out. Uh, and we've got Rhino Inside coming up and Enscape and all these other things that we're planning. So I launched Architect Network as a online platform to share knowledge about architecture and technology with the niche of having it from the perspective of working in practice over the last 10 years um, on projects from you know, amazing practices, working in firms like Big, because um, I saw there was a gap between in the market of uh, people teaching that haven't really spent much time in practice or like a super young and have just come out of practice, which yeah, is which is really, really totally good. True. And then on the other hand, you, you did have people teaching from a practice, but it was like super, uh, you know, super deep knowledge or it just wasn't very accessible um so i felt like there was a missing gap in the middle where i'm trying to teach um from the perspective of being in practice and these this is the stuff that actually works uh in practice right now uh to hopefully prepare the next generation of architects and current generation because the adoption of technology in the industry has been slow and it's a big reason why there's a ton of room for disruption in uh, the AEC industry. So, uh, so yeah, that's how Architect Network kind of emerged. That's great. So I am really interested in your Grasshopper Masterclass. And when you say Masterclass, would that teach me how to, you know, I'll write a couple of lines to make a building out of those couple of lines and they have my <laughs> panels all set out and laid out in those couple of lines or... What is it yeah. in Compass? So most of our master classes at the moment are based on like zero to hero kind of approach, right? You've never opened Grasshopper. So we go from the very basics of the interface, uh, but we want to teach core skills. So like thinking computation is our first course, right? How do you break a problem down into bite-sized chunks? We try and explain lists right? And things like data trees, because as soon as you 
like a lot of grasshopper courses I did at the beginning of me learning grasshopper, it was like, uh, here's how you make a parametric facade. Just connect all these things and then you twist this and that's it. And you were taught like how to do it, but you weren't really taught like why, you know, the thinking behind it and the core aspect of like, you know, someone didn't tell me a list. They're just like, oh, just flatten it here. And I was like, well, what is flattening? And was, I just flatten it here and then continue with your script. And so, yeah, we go from uh, all the basics of, of uh, Grasshopper. We build a couple projects from Big, which culminates in rebuilding the Serpentine Pavilion um, that me and uh, Guillaume, who's also a computational designer at Big, and we go through actually the way that you create that script because you also see that script everywhere online, but mm -hmm. no one has got it right. Like, Haven't properly. you done a course actually on that already? Yeah, there's, well, that, that's our course. That's our Grasshopper Masterclass. Okay. Um, and yeah, we the final point is uh, the Serpentine. As the Serpentine has also become like our, our uh, base project to test things on. So like... Uh, We've used it as a way to bring geometry from Rhino to, to Grasshopper to Revit and all that kind of stuff. Great. I'm all about education, especially on the architecture side of things, uh, architecture technology, because I do agree with you uh, from my experience working also in a place like London, where, you know, again, this is to me the design capital of the world in a way. Uh, I was also quite surprised how few people are eager to learn something new once they're in practice. I yeah. think younger staff, they inevitably have to, especially with the education in the UK, which on the tech side of things, it's not very strong unless you go to, you know, a couple of units in the Bartlett or a couple of units at the AA. The rest of it, you know, the, I mean, we had to teach the guys how to use SketchUp for God's sakes, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that was another thing that we saw was like students are, you know, we come out of uni now with a ton of debt and you see like people are not even taught the basic programs that they will need on day one of being in practice. And in some cases, like we either saw universities were teaching super emerging uh, software um, uh, not to like pick one uh, out of the crowd, but like, you know, they come out and they learn Houdini and they could do all this cool stuff in Houdini. But then if they come into architecture practice, it's just, you know, I can't use that right now. So, like, mm. you know, and then on the other hand, you'd get the other end of the spectrum where for whatever reason, the professor or the dean of the school loves uh, Archicad. So everyone learns, learns Archicad, which is also great. But the reality is maybe 90% of firms use, use Revit. So <laughs> there was always this gap and or a, a lot of time, we talk to, I talk to students all the time and I'm like, are you taught programs? And it's, it's almost expected that you teach yourself the programs and we just focus on design. So we also saw there was a massive gap in university, uh, to learn technology. Um, and so that's another reason why we started architect network. And it's another reason why we try and make the courses as accessible and as affordable as possible. So as many people can access them. Uh, for example, our Grasshopper Masterclass was live. It was free live on YouTube. Um, and we had 600 people sign up and use the course over time. And um, they were from everywhere in the world. Like the most amazing thing, we had people from over 80 countries. And so Wonderful. it gets especially interesting when you think of emerging uh, parts of the world like uh you know, Africa is going to be a huge part of uh, the next boom in construction. India have like, uh, I think recently they surpassed China for the, their population. And so it's a growing country that's going to be building a lot. And so, of course, over there, the next genera generation of architects need to be teched up to to build sustainably and, and affordably. At scale, right? The kind of At scale, scale right? that's required so, to house so, all those people. Exactly. So by teaching online, they can gain knowledge from people like myself uh, at a really affordable rate or sometimes for free. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's a big goal of like how we want to kind of spread the word of ATN and not only teach like in London and uh, 
New York and, you know, these big cities. Fantastic. It's about having the most amount of impact. Exactly, and yeah. on, I, we definitely agree there because I also do online courses with the same sort of mentality, you know, is give people access to these tools, show it from, you know, some of the best profession, professionals in the world, how it's being used in some of the best companies in the world and show them that it is possible and accessible. Now, entertain me for a bit. So if we imagine the ideal candidate, you know, part two, so recent grad candidate that comes into the office, what would the skills that they would ideally have is? Would it, would it be more on the design side of things? Would it be more on the software side of things? Or would it be maybe not so recent graduate who has uh, architectural technical knowledge as well? Yeah, so um, I think first and foremost, you, you got to be a, a good designer right and have that design component and that design skill set then you know we're, we're not looking for people that have every software under the sun and are advanced and of course on everyone's cv they are like the uh you know like a revit ninja and a, <laughs> <laughs> all this kind of stuff and uh, in reality they've like done a an hour's course at university or something like that um I, I actually did a video on uh, YouTube where I go through uh, the skill sets, an architect skill set. And at the end of it, I kind mm. of go through what I would expect you to know. So I think at university, like you really want the, f the core foundation of communicating as an architect, which means you need to have a modeling uh, software that you're good at, Rhino, SketchUp, Blender, whatever it is. Uh, you need to have be able to communicate that. So have some kind of viz skill set so you know enscape v-ray twin motion whatever that is um and if, as well as the the you know what i say are the classics like the graphic side photoshop illustrator InDesign. although i feel that is is kind of a you know most people know that so a minimum you need a kind of like uh modeling and viz skill set uh, as well as graphics and then i i suggest people to like pursue something that you're interested in and really go for it. So the one thing you can come out of university with that uh, you can't gain experience, you can't, you know, you can't cheat that. Um, but the one thing you can do is that you could become like, you can have a little, what I call superpower in viz. So like, let's say you're amazing at visualization. That's like a really cool thing to see coming out of university or you, you have jumped into grasshopper or something like that. So, I think you need, specifically if you come to big, of course, Rhino is a big one. You you need to be pretty solid at Rhino. You need to have a good visualization skill set and graphic skill set, which is why your portfolio is quite important because it shows how you can do that. And then, you know, if you do have, I think that's that would be great. And then if you do have other things like a BIM component or a computational component or AR, VR, that's a really amazing thing but it's a nice to have but it it could make you stand out from the crowd as well so you know i don't expect fresh guys to come out and they're like you know experts in bim and you know grasshopper legends and things like that of course we're going to build up skill sets but that what i would say is the foundation right you need to be able to model pretty well communicate graphically and and in the viz world well, your expectations are definitely higher than what my experience has showed me, <laughs> especially getting part part ones or part twos in the office when I used to work at a HOK. Uh, yeah. The skills were all over the place, but nowhere near a level that uh, was suitable for office work, which in some ways I would respect if those people at least knew the theoretical elements of the design of general design, but there was also a gap of that. So I wasn't sure what they were studying because I did my studies in the US, so I'm not quite familiar with part ones and yeah. part twos in the UK. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always, it can really vary, right? It's like what university you come from, uh, are they super into the tech side of things? Where in the world they studied? Like it can really vary. And even let's say just within the UK, 
it's super varied. Like, like I said, some universities teach all that stuff and some don't. So, um, yeah, it's always, it's always a mixed bag, but those I think are the key components that you need. And looking back at it now, as we were talking, I'm just thinking about the people that I know that are quite good at grasshopper, you know, a few of them had, had had courses units at university of Westminster, where they were taught grasshopper, but most of them learned on their own at work at university, maybe during both. And they sort of picked up those skills at the level that actually makes a difference in their daytime jobs. Yeah, it's, um, of course, it's like you want to explore in your own time as well, you know, and that's where like picking up online courses is a great way to start. But of course, the people Definitely. that pick it up is the ones that like tinker with it and try and implement it on something that they're doing. That's, you know, the best way to learn is to to, to just do it on a product, right? Uh, of course, you can just yeah. do that from scratch. So it's usually like... Uh, get an online course, learn the basics, learn the fundamentals well, and then you got to keep using it to, to really pick it up. 10 years ago, is it 10? Yeah, about 10 years ago when I was learning Grasshopper, I was working on a theater while I was at Agile Associates. And back then, I don't think there were many online courses. Uh, yeah. no, nor, because the office is fairly small, uh, there weren't that many competent Grasshopper users in the office. But yeah. they knew with the amount of changes that we had to produce in regards to the outer shape and how the theater needs to kind of be completely reconfigured. The only way to do that and not lose my mind was with the script. I still lost my mind because, you know, I spent countless weekends and long nights trying to sort it out. And I really wish back then, you know, that there were the sources that we have today with the numerous platforms that teach those fundamental skills, including your courses. Yeah, I think um, especially online now, you've got a lot of choices, right? Especially with YouTube, uh, there's paid courses versus unpaid courses. There's almost, there's a lot out there. But um, like I said, there's still a variation of these qualities. So I think now uh, students have a lot more to learn from. But now you've got to pick through the ones that are actually useful um so yeah i think like you know whilst we were in practice in the early days and learning these things you have less places to learn so now i think students have a ton of places to find new things uh but now it's just finding the good ones and like the <laughs> the relevant ones yeah definitely um, right. Okay. So I think we're coming to a close here. I'm just looking at the clock and <laughs> time seems to be flowing by yeah. when you're having fun talking, yeah. but I wanted to ask you a question that you asked me yesterday, right? And I think it's a great question to ask. And that is what you're the most excited about in regards to architecture and technology coming up. Yeah. Um, obviously I'm, I'm a little, it's a little bit of a cheat question cause I'm, I'm asking this, I'm always thinking it, about it myself. So yeah. For me right now, um, I mean, you can't ignore the AI wave that's coming, right? Uh, I think it's super exciting. And I'm in, every day I'm like reading something new that I want to spend time looking into. Uh, so AI is definitely one. And the other one is the kind of uh, the emergence of game engines in our industry. I'm particularly excited about Unreal 5 right now. Um, so I'd say I'm trying to of course, for me, I, I'm excited about everything. So sometimes I have to like, you know, I'm excited about <laughs> Blender as well, which is how we got this chatting. Um, there's all these exciting things going on. But I think the two things this year, this every year I try and like add to my skill set. Um, and so this year, a couple of things, I'm really been pushing the AI side and trying to keep up to speed and up to date with the AI that's going on in the industry. But also Unreal, I'm really excited to, add unreal to my skill set particularly unreal 5 so uh hopefully later this year you'll see some cool things coming out of unreal uh from atn and from big and all this kind of stuff so yeah i'll keep my answer a little bit simple i'll just say ai and unreal uh and by well. ai you mean like chat gpt in mid journey or something else ai is a bit more general because like of course yeah those are the things i'm playing around with right now, chat GPT, 
mid journey, but you know, I know that that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? There's image creation. We're in the world of image creation, but um, you know, soon we'll see that there already there's already text to 3D model. There's already text to BIM. If you go and check out Hypar's latest uh, videos from Andrew uh, Human, um, so right. I'll have to check that out. It's all it's all like emerging. So uh, I'm I'm playing around with Mid Journey a lot and trying to like perfect it as you know as a design component of myself and trying creating things and just having fun uh but of course i'm also looking at like how is this going to transition to the aec space like don't forget that all this image creation stuff is just ai that's got a general intelligence right in the it's not general intelligence the technical term but uh it hasn't been trained to be an architect yet and that's going to be kind of mind-blowing in itself. So I think with the AI side, it's more broad and just keeping up to speed with what's going on. That's the challenge mm. right now. Cause it's, and they're like, what is actually uh, useful versus what's kind of like a red herring. Um, yeah, that's a bit of an English phrase, but it's like a, a distraction from the real promise of, of AI. So um, yeah, those are two things I'm super excited about. And about Unreal, is it just the fact that the environment can handle billions and billions of polygons that's particularly exciting? So you can bring like, you know, a digital think, twin or is it something else? I think it's kind of, it's just quite open-ended in that like, of course the fidelity of Unreal 5 is, is quite exciting. Like it looks an incredible environment, but I'm a big, like, let's say once you get, your project or whatever it is into an unreal environment, the options to go places are kind of very open-ended. You could, your project, you could pipe it into the metaverse because most of that side of things is game engine orientated. It can go to a, a game engine and become a game. Uh, you then got AR, VR that you could use out of it. Um, it could be a digital twin to use another buzzword, uh, but it, you could also just use it for your images, animation, and storytelling, right? So I think once you've spent time developing an Unreal scene, there's so many, so much potential to go out in different directions. So I think it's just the open-endedness. And of course, yeah, the quality looks super good. So uh, yeah, it's, it's not one specific thing. I'm just, uh, it just seems to be very powerful. And do you, is Unreal being used in one form or another in the office? Yeah, slowly we're starting to tinker with it um, and develop a skill set in it, but uh, we're still in early stages. So there's some products we've been in there and, and uh, tried to create something for a project. Um, but yeah, we're, we're kind of developing that skill set now. And the people that are participating in those projects are they architects or are they more yeah. from a gaming background no we always try and develop technology on a product so we don't have a lot of r d you know I, I don't sit and just do something for uh r d purposes it's usually like taking a product and seeing if we could use it on a product or uh use it as a test case at best so but always we're trying to test this on a project as we go for sure actually thank you for saying that because that was another question i remember i had in my notes is whether you guys have like a computational research division and i think you just answered it that for right now it's mostly project-based yeah we, we're, we're less heavy on research and more on project-based but you know like i said we have a bim a bim crew a computational crew and all this kind of stuff but uh, but surely you must have your own Revit add-ins, right? For sheets, for things like that. Yeah, like, you know, we have Pi Revit Bar and things like that. But, um, you know, we, we we don't get too deep into tool making, as in, like, uh, coming up with our own plugins and things like that. Um, it's more adopting stuff that's out there and implementing it on projects. Like, that's that's really where we where we kind of function the best, I think. I see. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Oliver. And it's been a pleasure talking to you. And uh, yeah, so if there's anything else you'd like to add, let us know. And if not, 
you know i think we we'll, i have a feeling we'll be chatting yeah probably more frequent than i thought initially you know based on our common interests and what could potentially be uh yeah i'm really excited for potential rhino versus blender yeah, yeah. you know battle yeah that, for sure let's do it <laughs> in our sword suit yeah no thank you so much for uh for having me um of course if you want to check out atn you can check us out on youtube or uh archie.tech on the web or on instagram um but yeah for sure we'll be talking soon and yeah maybe let's try and do this blender uh blender a model off of blender versus being awesome. model off i'm not sure you're gonna win but let's try it <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I'm not so confident either but i'll try <laughs> Who knows? I mean, you design real facades for Morpheus Hotel. You know, that's a yeah. that that that's a ninja skill. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks a lot for having yeah. me, and uh, all excited to talk again in the future. Take care. <laughs>